the 91st Governor of the State of New Hampshire, the Honorable Meldrum Thompson, Jr. Mr. Armour, Mr. Welch, ladies and gentlemen, I have just passed to Mr. Armour a note from Mr. Welch saying that I have 30 minutes, not 20. First, I'd like to say that uh, I attended the last council meeting and meeting of the John Birch Society and spoke in Dallas, Texas. At that time, Mr. Welch indicated to the audience that he had invited me to attend as a member of the council, and I had declined, indicating I wanted more time to study. And I have studied in the meantime. And in addition, I had another reservation. I didn't mention this to Mr. Welch, but I know altogether too well, as I'm sure you do too, that those who run for public office and are members of the John Birch Society often have troubles at the poll. Larry McDonald is a splendid exception. And I have, in thinking this matter over, was thinking about Jimmy Carter being a member of the Trilateral Commission, Mondale being a member, Vance being a member, Blumenthal being a member, and I have decided that if the invitation is still open, Mr. Welch, that perhaps the John Birch Society could use a governor, albeit he is an ex-governor, as a member. And if that means, friends, that I'm never elected to public office again, so be it. I will be with a great group of Americans. <laughs> the tragedy of Taiwan that unfolds before our eyes today must provoke in every patriotic American a number of poignant emotions. There is a feeling of sorrow and sadness for a great and loyal ally. And who has not felt dismay and disgust at a deceitful American administration that would spurn the promises and treaties of the past to embrace the largest and probably worst communist nation in the world? Then there is the eerie emotion intertwining all others of deep and foreboding concern that America is being led by trilaterally indoctrinated president down the tortuous path of international communism to ultimate enslavement. I have made four trips to Taiwan beginning in 1971. While that does not qualify me as a China expert, it did afford me an opportunity to learn something of the history and economy of this truly great showcase of freedom in the far Pacific. No country in the world has had as much experience fighting communism as the Republic of China. Led by the late Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, 
The nationalist forces have fought the communists since 1931, or for almost a half century. From the Marco Polo Bridge incident in 1937 to 1945, Chiang Kai-shek fought against Japan from without and the communists from within. During the crucial war years following Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the nationalists at times pinned down on the mainland of China as many as three million Japanese troops, which otherwise could have been used to carry the war to the shores of America. For this great help in an hour of dire need for America, an ungrateful Truman administration deliberately undermined the fortunes of the young Republic of China, which had emerged victorious from a most difficult eight-year war. The Truman administration made no protest against the Russians, turning over to the Chinese communists the vast war, war supplies taken from the Japanese. Thus armed, the communists were able to intensify their war against Chiang Kai-shek. The nationalists pleaded with the United States for sufficient arms to carry on the fight with the communists. Their pleas were heard by a sympathetic Republican-controlled Congress. And early in 1948, approximately a quarter of a billion dollars in military aid for the nationalists was voted. Unfortunately, the devious George C. Marshall then Secretary of State, who was once described by Senator Jenner as a man whose whole life had been a living lie, was able to prevent the shipment of so much as a dime's worth of military aid to Chiang Kai-shek. Without the ammunition and guns with which to fight, the nationalists were driven from the mainland. Thus, a young, emerging free China, which after 34 years of revolution and war, was in a position to bring to the vast subcontinent of China prosperity and stability, found instead that it was driven onto the island of Taiwan by the complicity of the United States. Drawing on his experience on the mainland, Chiang Kai-shek later wrote, it is my earnest hope, he said, that the bitter lesson of China has, has learned during the past three decades may be of use to other countries now facing the same threat of communism. Often it is not easy, he said, for leaders of free nations to realize the presence of this threat in their midst, and when they do, it may already be too late. Imagine, if you can, the heartache that must have lain heavy in every breast of Chiang Kai-shek's defeated troops as they withdrew from their homeland after 30 years of hard, bloody fighting. Many left parents and relatives behind. Some even had to leave wives and children never to see them more. Yet, from such hopeless, dismal beginnings, these remnants of the once strong nationalist government laid aside their weapons of war and began the building of a new free China, the Republic of China, whose flag bears a white sun on a blue field over crimson ground. Beginning life anew in Taiwan was not easy. The island was small, just twice the size of the small state of New Hampshire. Its natural resources were limited, its arable land scarce, its agriculture primitive, and its economy poor. Yet this tiny island had to sustain a population of 13 million 
that has now grown to more than 17 million. In just 30 years, the highly imaginative and industrious people of Taiwan, working under a freely instituted government of their own choice, performed a unique industrial miracle. The agriculture of the people of Taiwan is one of the finest in the world. Although tillable land is in short supply, the government encouraged successful land reform that put good land in the hand of the tillers and then proceeded to teach the farmers how to irrigate, fertilize, use insecticides, and pool resources in cooperative ways. Today, Taiwan exports rice, is the world's largest producer of mushrooms, and one of the largest producers of pineapples and melons. It has become an enchanted garden of great value, raising in some places three bumper crops a year. Like a rare good neighbor, the government many years ago began a program of teaching the people of underdeveloped nations how to raise successful crops. Over the years, they have sent their agricultural experts to nations around the world, to the Near East, Africa, and Central and South America. Their performances in other areas are equally dramatic. There are more than 100 colleges and universities in Taiwan. Public education is compulsory through the ninth grade. Ten years ago, the government began ten major projects, a great new international airport, a new steel mill, a new shipyard so large that two years ago it was able to launch the third largest tanker in the world, a superhighway, the equal of the best in the United States that runs for more than 300 miles the length of the island, a tremendous new seaport, a vast railroad reconstruction program, and a nuclear generation program that encompasses the building of six nuclear plants. Most of these projects are complete, and the remainder soon will be. The most spectacular progress in Taiwan has been made in industrialization. The export processing zone in the city of Koshan is a beehive of industrial activity where hundreds of millions of dollars in goods are produced every year. Here, raw materials are brought into the zone duty-free, processed and shipped abroad in quality and price that marks them, makes them highly attractive in the world's markets. The land of Taiwan is no richer than that of the mainland. The people of the Republic of China are physically no different than those of Red China. But there is one compelling distinction between the people of these two countries. One is free and the other slave. <laughs> Their economic systems are quite different also. One operates a free enterprise economy and the other by government controls. And this basic distinction of freedom accounts for superiority of life on Taiwan compared to that on the mainland. For example, Taiwan has the second highest literacy in the Pacific area, second only to Japan. The per capita income in Taiwan is $1,500. In red China, it is $330. In 1978, two-way tra trade between Taiwan and the United States amounted to seven and a half billion dollars. Two-way trade between Red China and the United States for the same period was slightly less than one billion. To appreciate the enormity of the trade gap between these two countries, we must bear in mind that Taiwan has less than 18 million people compared to about 900 million in Red China. The average wage in Red China is $25 per month. In Taiwan, the average wage is slightly more than $100 per month. Thus, we can see what dramatic growth can be achieved 
under free institutions. A small but very significant indication of the kind of pride and honor of the people of the Republic of China can be seen in the fact that Taiwan, in 1965, voluntarily asked the United States to discontinue its foreign aid to the island republic. Do you know of another country in the world that has voluntarily backed away from Uncle Sam's proffered help? I don't. Our long relationship as trading partners, our years as brothers in arms, as co-workers in industrial development, years of people-to-people -people exchange, admiration and affection, all should draw our two nations inseparably together. We basically believe in human rights, and incidentally did it long before there was a Jimmy Carter, and respect them. So too do the people of Taiwan. We believe in religious freedom, in a free press, and free elections, and within the frailties of human nature, we endeavor to practice them. So too do the people of Taiwan. But human rights of any kind do not exist under the murderous communist regime in Red China. In fact, in the name of revolution and communism, it is estimated that more than 60 million persons have lost their lives in Red China in the last 50 years. We cannot speak of communism and Chinese culture in the same breath. They are at opposite poles, as foreign to each other as Genghis Khan and his murdering Mongol hordes of 800 years ago were to the Chinese of that day. Chiang Kai-shek tells us that the Chinese Communist Party is not indigenous to China. It is, he says, an outgrowth of Soviet Russia. The direction of the footprints of a people can tell you the conditions of the country in which they live. For years, thousands of footprints, many made by bare, bleeding, and sore feet, have left their mark along the escape routes from mainland China. Even today, more than 3,000 a year are still traversing those routes. Every year, thousands of Chinese lose their lives in vain efforts to obtain th freedom through Hong Kong. I have a friend who in his early teens left his family and made his escape to Taiwan after many harrowing hardships. He is now a successful career officer in the Foreign Service of the Republic of China. One of the most dramatic escapes from the mainland was made by the ex MiG pilot Fan Yan Yen, July 7th, 1977. Fan, at age 41, was a Chinese Communist squadron leader. His squadron was transferred to Fukien province, which lies across the Taiwan Straits from Kemoi. While flying his MiG-19 at the head of his squadron on the afternoon of July 7th, he peeled out of formation and flew full throttle toward Tainan, air base in southern Taiwan, with some of his squadron members in hot pursuit. Fan was the fifth pilot to defect to Taiwan in 17 years. For 20 years he had been a Communist Party member. His wife, my wife and I had the pleasure of meeting Fan when we were in Taiwan in the fall of 77. And incidentally, an apple is a prized possession in Taiwan. We took a bag of apples to Fan, and you should have seen the expression that lighted up on his face. At a press conference held the day after his escape from the mainland, Fan made the following revealing statements about the conditions in Red China. He said, I couldn't stand it any longer. Life on the mainland is terrible. 
I came because there is no freedom under the communists. The peasants there have little to eat and little to wear. With regard to the attitude of Red China's leaders, including Deng Xiaoping, toward the United States, Fan said, I think the Chinese communists are trying to use America in their confrontations with Russian revisionists. Well, he said, an enemy is an enemy regardless of whether it is a primary or a secondary one. America is still their enemy. When asked how the Red Leaders explained the visits of Kissinger and Nixon, Fan said that the official line in Peking was that Nixon had come with a white flag. Fan also said that the people on the mainland were told that Japan had acted as the leading goat in opening relations with Red China and that Britain had played that role for Europe. It is significant that a year and a half before Carter recognized Red China, Fan said in his first press conference after landing in Taiwan that the Pekin regime eventually will try to liberate Taiwan by force, but only after the United States establishes diplomatic relations with Peking. That moment will come, he said, when the communists, strengthened by their U.S. ties, can deploy troops from the Soviet border to the coast opposite Taiwan and pose an invasion threat. Fan was naturally fearful that reprisals would be made against his wife and three children. He asked Secretary of State Cyrus Vance to appeal to Peking on their behalf, but he has never heard a word from the Secretary. A good case can be made that on two different occasions America stabbed in the back one of its most friendly, helpful, and trustworthy allies, the Republic of China. In large measure, we were responsible for the defeat of Chiang Kai-shek on the mainland in 1949. Some 20 years later, after the election of Richard Nixon as president, we again began a deliberate and secret undermining of the Republic of China while pretending before the world that we were a firm friend and ally of Taiwan. First, there was the visit of the U.S. ping-pong team to Red China in April of 1971. This was followed by Nixon easing the U.S. trade embargo against Peking. Next, in quick succession, a Nixon study group headed by former U.N. Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge urged that Red China be admitted to the United Nations but said that the continued membership of nationalist China was imperative. Our perfidious and ignominious course of desertion of Taiwan covertly continued on, no on October 25th, 1971, when the United Nations adopted the Albanian resolution to seat Mao Zedong's communists and oust Kung, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists. Where were the vo voices of protest against this recognition of Red China. Did our ambassador to the United Nations protest? Did President Nixon? Did the leaders of Congress? No. There was only deafening silence. Did our delegation to the United Nations rise up in righteous indignation and walk out of the UN Assembly with our true friends of the Republic of China? No. They sat on their unprincipled and spineless duffs, a shameless disgrace to the memory of the courageous men who founded this nation. <laughs> next, came, next came the white flag visit of Nixon to Peking in February of 1972. And thus the unfolding of our faithless and treacherous dealings with the Republic of China continued through the administrations of Ford and Carter until now the very existence of that far Pacific showcase of freedom rests tenuously in our soiled hands. You would think that a John Adams would have risen in the Congress earlier this week 
and denounce the despicable conduct of those political Pharisees who led this once great nation from the virtues of freedom to the cesspool of Chinese communism. It is true, there were a few, a precious six, in the Senate who voted against the miserable accommodation bill that neatly strips the Republic of China of its sovereignty and leaves it defenseless against the rapacious communist regime of the mainland. Some friend, we have been to the Republic of China. Where now in this sad and bleeding old world of ours will we find a free nation that will ever trust us again? Now comes Jimmy Carter to put a hammerlock on beaten Taiwan by indicating that in a few weeks he hopes to extend to Red China the most favored nation trading status. This he justifies under 19 U.S.C. section 2432 because the number of immigrants permitted to leave the mainland has allegedly increased from 25 a year ago to 2,000 now. By extending the most favored nation trading status to Red China and the Soviet Union, as Carter has said he soon hopes to do, tariffs on the slave-made goods of these two communist countries will be lowered as much as 200 percent. Thus, our American market will become a dumping ground for products made by pressure by persons working for as little as 10 cents an hour. This move by President Carter will set in motion a strangulation of Taiwan that could economically weaken this country so that its people could no longer stand against the tyranny of Red China. Have you ever stopped to think what is behind the long series of cunning, deceitful moves by the leaders of our nation that have now consigned 17 million people to the grim prospect of a living death under communism? I may not have the answer, but I'll tell you what I believe. I think America has been misled by two powerful forces, namely lust for power by politicians and greed for profits by businessmen. Greed for profits by the businessmen of ancient Carthage was the ultimate undoing of that once powerful nation, for the people were more interested in getting and spending than supporting Hannibal in his life-or-death struggle with the Romans. Our greedy international businessmen are happy to accommodate themselves with communism if they can but make their annual profits. This is why Lenin said we would buy the rope by which we would eventually hang ourselves. That is just what we do when we extend the most favored nation status to the two most powerful communist nations in the world. That is what our hypocritical leaders do for us when they free Red China's bank credits of 81 million frozen 30 years ago and in exchange agree to pay off 41 cents on the dollar for frozen American assets in Peking worth 191 million. Even worse, we are accepting a payoff that in true value amounts to only 15 cents on the dollar due to inflation. And then we are going to let Red China make the payments over a six-year period without interest. We would not worry if it were only the businessmen who suffered our one-sided deals with communist countries. But instead, it is invariably the American taxpayer who picks up the tab. Who do you think guarantees the $10 billion in credits the administration has offered to Red China over the next three years? Or who will stand behind the 5 to $10 billion bribe to Egypt and Israel for settling their differences? Or who will pay the $2 billion guaranteed to the dictator Torrijos for his kindness in accepting our gift of the Panama Canal? None other, my friends, than you and I, the taxpayers. We cannot contemplate the long and dishonorable train of events which have thus crushed the once happy and friendly nation, the Republic of China, without realizing that this was not a series of coincidences. No, 
This was a carefully contrived and skillfully, skillfully executed conspiracy involving many high and low ranking American officials. Oh, what need we have tonight to give heed to the warning of George Washington in his farewell address when he urged on his countrymen that they should stand against the insidious evils of foreign influence. The jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of republican government. Washington also cautioned that in public as well as private affairs, honesty is always the best policy. <laughs> Let the man who promised America that he would be truthful and honest begin keeping his word before it is too late for all Americans. I do not believe that Jimmy Carter is a communist any more than I believe that David Rockefeller or Henry Kissinger are ones, but they all could be for all I know. <laughs> but when you consider what this administration has done to Rhodesia, South Africa, and Iran, that it gave our valuable and vital Panama Canal to a communist dictator, recognized the murderous Red China regime, and reduced our true ally, Free China, to a diplomatic cipher, we must conclude that Jimmy Carter has done more to advance international communism than any man in the world since Joseph Stalin. What now, what now of Taiwan? I have had briefings by top military personnel in Taiwan. I have visited their army, navy, and marine headquarters. I have spoken to their troops in Atlas Hall, far underground on Kemoi. The active and reserve military are well trained and equipped. More important, their morale and spirit is as good, if not better, than the troops of Israel and South Africa, which I have seen. They love freedom, and they mean to keep it. <laughs> Even with its superior fleet of submarines, Red China will not be able, in my judgment, to defeat Free China within the next few years. Only with the con Continued conniving of the Carter administra administration could free China be destroyed eventually. We can change all of this, friends, in 1980 and once again cast the beam of freedom's hope on the troubled waters of the world. To do this, we must drive from the seats of power in the White House, Congress, and the State Department all of the foul brood of commie lovers. Can it be true that Jimmy Carter is determined to fasten on the necks of his countrymen the cruel yoke of communism? That seems to be his goal. But with God's help, you and I must see that he never achieves that goal. <laughs> Friends, never since the days of the revolution have our freedoms been so endangered? The question is, are we ready to fight to preserve them? With John Adams, I say to you tonight that I have passed my Rubicon. Sink or swim, live or die, survive or perish, I am with my country from this day on. Friends, we must restore decency and honesty to the State Department. 
In this critical battle for the survival of America, we shall not tolerate a no-win settlement. Let us join with the Lord in sounding forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Thank you.